Years ago, Matthew Duman embarked on a grotesque safari, trekking thousands of miles to ten American institutions of higher education in search of their most fascinating architectural sculpture. At last he returned with hundreds of images, revealing the grotesque secrets of the Grotesque Ten, amazing architectural sculpture from ten American colleges and universities. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Grotesque Ten. My name is Matthew Dumit, and you might be wondering why I'm dressed like this. Well, it's because I'm going to take you on a safari to a place where you can observe the behavior of gargoyles and grotesques in their natural habitat. In other words, the American college campus. So, let's get started. <clears throat> Many years ago, I noticed this sculpture at Yale University. It not only led me to, not only sparked my interest in the grotesque and gargoyles at Yale, but led me to ex explore other universities in search of interesting sculpture. Now you may be thinking, what's so interesting about this one? And what does it even mean? Well, it is a bit confusing but I'll keep you in suspense as to the meeting until the end of my lecture, but keep this image in your head. 10, it's a nice round number, isn't it? In this case, it refers to the number of institutions of higher education that I have visited. Many of these schools are quite well known, but I did not choose them for their reputation or academic prowess. I chose them because each is a collection of artwork on their campus that I find very interesting. I'm not talking about items in the museums or archives, but sculpture on many of their academic buildings themselves. Each has examples of a, of a building style called collegiate Gothic architecture, a characteristic style, which is a revival of the Gothic architectural style of medieval Europe, yet was actually constructed in America during the 19th and early 20th centuries. Like their medieval cousins, Many of these buildings are decorated with fascinating sculpture, which are referred to architecturally as grotesques. Therefore, my book is called The Grotesque Ten. It features amazing architectural sculpture from 10 American colleges and universities. This sculpture can be particularly interesting because while it is meant to look ancient, it can possess modern concepts and themes. Now, what schools make up the Grotesque Ten? Well, there are a variety. Some were founded in the 19th century, and even a few from the 18th, but all possess some form of architectural sculpture on their campus buildings. The 10 schools featured in my book are Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania, Duke University in North Carolina, Northwestern University in Illinois, Princeton University in New Jersey, Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, the City College of New York, in New York City, Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, the University of Chicago in Illinois, the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and because I keep finding new sculpture there even after years of exploring, Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Gothic architecture came out of medieval Europe. Even back then, it was not new to decorate buildings with sculptural flourishes. But in medieval times, it was common to apply sculpture to churches and cathedrals to scare away evil spirits, or on a more practical level, to graphically demonstrate lessons of morality from the church, because much of the parish population at the time were illiterate. Universities at this time were closely associated with the church. Often academic life revolved around a cathedral. So the architecture of the church greatly influenced that of university buildings. This carried through the modern times. See the shape of the windows, the use of spires and roughly cut stone in the walls in this building from Duke University. Now, when we look at these buildings, are we to believe multiple groups of architects, masons, glaziers, and other artisans came to North America during the medieval period and set about constructing Gothic building projects in far-flung places on a wild and unexplored continent? Well, if you believe this, then contact me after the lecture because I've got some lucrative investment opportunities for you. So in other words, no, of course not. Dude. Examples like this are obviously much younger than those in medieval Europe. The collegiate Gothic trend became popular in the mid 19th century and remained so through the 1930s and is still in use today. Rockefeller Hall was built at Bryn Mawr in 1904. 
Bass Tower was constructed at Yale in 2017. So why did college architects look backward for inspiration when designing academic buildings? Not surprisingly, a big reason was financial. Even the oldest colleges in North America are new compared to the old world institutions of Europe. American colleges also lack the cultural status of those of Europe had. And 150 years ago, our universities were not looked upon with the nostalgia and respect that they are today. Reviving venerable building traditions like Gothic was a great way to create an unspoken connection with the long established universities of Europe. This connection elevates the status and prestige of American universities and in turn, their endowments and donations as well. Now, there are a variety of historic styles. Many of these and other college campuses have, camp have buildings that were constructed in other architectural styles, such as the, the Georgian style from 18th century England, or the classical style from ancient Greece. Honestly, most campuses have become a mixture of many different styles. So why choose to revive Gothic for your college campus? Well, by the mid 19th century, the industrial revolution was in full swing. Though there were many positive advancements due to industrialization, many came to see mass production as a threat to individuality and individual craftsmanship. Gothic was seen to celebrate the individual, an individual expression. Think of the distinction between something that's handmade versus something that's mass produced. Also in a practical sense, Gothic encouraged asymmetry, like this building at Duke. This plan better fit the variety of uses collegiate buildings have to accommodate, such as athletic facilities, lecture halls, laboratories, dormitories, etc. Different functions that require different types of space. And most importantly for our examination, Gothic architecture is seen as timeless. Generally, Gothic, still, Gothic style buildings look, look old, no matter what the actual age of the building is. Now, I know it's a cliche, but it can be said that universities are like a, a fine wine. Wines improve with age and schools are seen in the same fashion. This concept is not lost on architects. While you can't change the actual age of a building, you can change the perceived age of it, or how old it looks. In fact, these architects use really subtle, some would say sneaky, techniques to enhance the age of their buildings. At Duke University in North Carolina, you can find some staircases which are worn from so many years of footsteps that the tread of the steps is grooved. These stairs have actually been molded with the groove in them from the beginning. These steps are meant to show the wear of many hundreds of years of footsteps on a staircase that, in actuality, is not yet a hundred years old. These were built in 1938. Another technique involves the roofs of these buildings. Most collegiate Gothic structures have slate rock shingling in their roofs. Look closely and you'll see many imperfections in the shingles, chips, cracks in the slate, and rough uneven surfaces, speaking of hundreds of years of exposure to the elements. As in the case of the stairs, many of these roofs were intentionally created this way, with chips and discolorations purposefully added. Other aging techniques involve the building of the walls themselves. Random window frames may have no glass and look to have been blocked up years after construction. These features are intended to give the building the look of sporadic renovations over hundreds of years. When in fact, the building was originally constructed with many, with many of these features from the start, like this, this false arched window at Yale. See how the, how the blocks in the window area match those of the surrounding wall? Look at this blocked up window at the City College of New York. Notice the presence of the iron bars to enhance the illusion that this was once a real window. But think about it. Why would they leave the iron bars there after sealing the window? What practical purpose do they serve now? And what criminal would try to break into a window that, that is now as solid as the wall around it? One decorative feature commonly seen in these buildings is the architectural niche. They're a tall, thin alcove, usually featuring a decorative canopy at the top and a flat platform at the base. They look like the perfect place for a statue, and some do contain just that. But more often than not, they are empty. These were intentionally left empty. You're supposed to assume that all these spaces were originally filled with dignified sculpture, but throughout the building's quote unquote, long and colorful history, most of these statues were stolen, 
destroyed or, or just plain removed, when in actuality, most of these niches were empty from the beginning. And lastly, never underestimate the aging effect of a good garnish of ivy. Mendel Hall from the University of Chicago dates from the late 19th century, but looks positively ancient when encased in ivy. These aging techniques are meant to work on passersby at an almost subliminal level, unconsciously leading you to draw the conclusion that these buildings are generally pretty darn old. You don't know how old, but definitely much older than any man-made structure nearby. This brings us to my favorite feature of Gothic buildings, grotesques. Putting sculpted decoration on collegiate Gothic buildings is a direct extension of the Gothic traditions of European architecture. Many early collegiate Gothic buildings have grotesques featuring medieval imagery, such as this king from the University of Chicago, another way to strengthen the connection between the institutions of the new and the old world. In architectural terms, a grotesque is a sculpted decoration on or in a building, and is usually in the form of a human, animal, or fanciful creature. And normally, their features are exaggerated to the point of caricature. A gargoyle is one type of grotesque. This is a specific kind which is used to channel rainwater off of the roof and away from the building, so as to protect the masonry from erosion. So basically, it's a decorative rain spout, hence the modern verb to gargle. I've already demonstrated how these buildings can mislead you, and the world of grotesques is no exception. This sculpture from the University of Chicago looks like a gargoyle, but look closely. It does not have a pipe or channel to drain water. I call these false gargoyles. While they are intended to look like gargoyles, they're just regular grotesques. To make it easier to understand, I've divided grotesques into categories based on their subject matter. When I began establishing categories for grotesques, I originally referred to them as different species to show that, like animals, grotesques can come in a wide variety of types, until I found there was a fatal flaw in this analogy. By definition, two animals of different species cannot produce offspring no matter what the sci-fi channel may tell you. So you'll never see a sharktopus or a whale wolf. By the way, these images are not in my book. But different breeds of animal reproduce all the time, like mixed breed dogs or cats. I find these types of grotesques to be a fascinating mix of meanings. Often you need to look at them many times in order to interpret the many different messages contained within because they may combine the characteristics of multiple breeds. A basic breed of grotesque is the historic variety. They portray something about the history of their building, its area of, its area of study, the school, town, state, or even country. At the back of Yale's Sterling Memorial Library, two reliefs depict similar occurrences but set 212 years apart. Yale was founded in 1701 in Brantford, Connecticut. The school built a college house in New Haven in 1718. One relief depicts the transport of Yale's books by an ox cart to the new building in New Haven, while the other portrays the unloading of Yale's books from a gasoline powered truck from the new, to the newly built Sterling Memorial Library in 1930. Demonstrative grotesque simply depicts some aspect of the purpose of their building. Howe's Chapel is part of the Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary on the campus of Northwestern in Illinois. The finial on its roof depicts two hands clasped together in prayer, a preview of the activity commonly found inside the chapel. The demonstrative grotesque seems a pretty straightforward concept, but things can get confusing as time moves on and buildings change their function. Rosenwald Hall at the University of Chicago serves as the admissions building, but began life as home to the Department of Geology. This explains the presence of relief portraying a saddlebag, rock hammers, bosses of sea life with the slogan, dig and discover them across the bottom. Collegiate Gothic buildings can also have the breed of grotesque that convey their meaning through allegory and symbols. As on the front of Northwestern University's Deering Library, where allegorical grotesques teach time-honored lessons, like a winged hourglass for a time flies, or a tortoise that crawls slowly past a sleeping hare recalling Aesop's fable and proclaiming, haste makes waste. An important breed of grotesque is those of the school spirit variety. They usually consist of a representation of the school's mascot or another symbol relating to the institution's identity. 
Trinity's mascot is the Bantam, a particularly stubborn and scrappy rooster. His likenesses can be found flanking the archway at the Downs Memorial Clock Tower. This gentleman is not the City College of New York's mascot, but he is displaying the school seal. And Handsome Dan the Bulldog is Yale's mascot. He can be found many places around Yale's campus, like looking out from his doghouse at Polly Murray Residence College. And judging by the, sh the state of his bowl, I think he wants to be fed. One of my favorite breeds is the facetious grotesque or the funny ones. Now, when writing this book, I intentionally left this breed for last, assuming that it would be the easiest one to write about because I find it the most enjoyable. However, when it came time to write this section, I quick quickly realized the huge distinction between telling a joke and explaining a joke. In my first attempt, I was trying to explain these grotesques, dissecting their message and at the same time stripping out all of the humor. Therefore, I let this breed of grotesque speak for themselves, such as this less than literate demon on Princeton University's Dillon Gymnasium, or this drunken patriot on Penn's residence quadrangle. Now, now that I look at it, this might have some of the historic grotesque, the horse historic breed of grotesque, if this is supposed to represent a drunken Ben Franklin. Another personal favorite of mine are those grotesques that are just plain bizarre. The facetious grotesques are attractive because they make us laugh and feel good. But what makes these bizarre grotesques so attractive? Well, here's my theory. From childhood, we humans are taught to believe that every question has an answer and every puzzle a solution. When we come upon puzzles such as these grotesques, they become inherently interesting to us because we get preoccupied with finding their meaning even when there may be no meaning to find, such as this baby ape in short pants on Washington University's Macmillan Hall. And I just don't know what to say about this one at the University of Pennsylvania's residence quadrangle. The spikes were put there so the birds don't land on the cornice, but I don't know what they were thinking when they sculpted this one. The final breed of grotesque is one that by its very nature gets little attention, and that's the reclusive breed. It's a type of architectural Easter egg and literally sneaks by most people. They can be as simple as abstract animals hiding in the decoration, such as, such as these abstracted tiger's heads. The tiger is Princeton's mascot hiding in the decor of Jones Hall. Or at Trinity, where you can find a rabbit and a monk carved literally underfoot into the flagstones of the floor of, of the cloisters at the chapel. Now that you know the general types of grotesques, Let's have a look at a few from each school of the Grotesque 10. Penn's expansive residence quadrangle is known by some as the Quad Tannic. Now, when I first heard this, I said, well, that's obvious. It's a huge, sprawling, ornately decorated residence complex. It covers almost three city blocks, and the west end of the quad comes to a point like the prow of a ship. Well, that's not why I was given the nickname. It was originally given the nickname the Quad Tannic by its maintenance staff, and that's because the basement always floods when it rains. One of my favorites at Penn is this guy in the quad. He's also on the cover of my book. This head is over four feet tall and mounted on the wall of a tunnel. These metal bars on each side meet to hold a, a lantern directly in front of the sculpture. I would imagine that encountering this sculpture under a harsh light late at night would be pretty unsettling. Oh, and also note the smaller, wacky faces on either side. Another bu building, the Evans Museum and Dental Institute, there are many grotesques on its walls, and some are a reminder of a time before painless dentistry. These statues are part of a series of four on the gates of the Penn Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. They were sculpted by Alexander Calder. Not the, not the artist who made the abstract mobiles from pieces of metal, rather his father, Alexander Sterling called it, who had a more realistic style. This series is symbolic of the four corners of the earth from which the museum draws its artifacts. Pictured here on the left is Africa and on the right, North America. Many grotesques line the entrance arches at Deering Library at Northwestern University. Some are allegorical grotesques illustrating Aesop's fables. Oh, and also note the, the empty niches between the arches. 
One fable represented, it's called the old and the young rat. According to this fable, a cunning old rat shown at the left finds a trap baited with delicious cheese. He kindly offers it to a naive young rat. The young rat is killed when he springs the trap while trying to retrieve the cheese, leaving it available for the old rat to enjoy. The moral, do not blindly accept gifts. Oh, note the books under the trap, suggesting this fable is set in Deering Library itself. Another fable shown is called The Old Woman in the Jug. An elderly woman who really loves wine finds a wine jug by the side of the road. To her disappointment, it's empty, but it still contains the delightful fragrance of wine that it once held. Now, while the moral is listed as the memory of a good deed lives on, I think a, a woman who is sniffing empty containers she finds on the side of the road has some deeper issues. These grotesques do not represent fables. Deering Library was designed as a place for serious study, portray at the left, but a browsing room was included so students could read for amusement as well, implied by the jester's outfit on the right. Duke University's West Campus is a beautiful example of collegiate Gothic architecture. The Philadelphia architecture firm of Horace Trumbauer designed the section of campus during the 1930s. The firm's lead designer, Julian Abiel, who actually designed most of these buildings, was African-American. He worked for Philadelphia and never traveled to Duke's campus to see his creations because he was opposed to the Jim Crow laws that were still in effect in North Carolina at the time. The cigarette in this laughing grotesque mouth is not part of the sculpture, but that is how I found it. Because the Duke family built much of its fortune from the tobacco trade, I thought it was appropriate, so I left it in. On the rear of Duke's original medical school building, you can find this horrified student. I like to think this is a first year medical student observing his first cadaver dissection. A vestibule in the residence quadrangles is a series of allegorical grotesques that convey an important overall message. That of hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, and think no evil. Taken individually, they're merely classical heads sporting vague hand gestures. But these enhance the meaning of one another by being located so close and together imply a theme, the four ways to avoid the many temptations inherent in college life. East Pine Hall, constructed in 1897, was among the first of Princeton's collegiate Gothic building. To show how serious the school was about the style of their buildings, Princeton's campus planners had to threaten to fire the architect, William Potter, when he wanted to build it in a different style. 1879 Hall has lots of mischievous monkeys. These are not demonstrative grotesques, as there are never any actual monkeys here. These are allegorical grotesques, depicting students as under-evolved primates, annoying a professor who is portrayed as human. This shows that Princeton professors had themselves evolved from rambunctious students. Princeton's graduate college has these joyriding sweethearts roaring down the road in the newfangled motor car. A goose and a pig leaped to get out of the way of their tires. They were called the modern youth in a New York Times article from 1927 because both were smoking and the woman's hair is scandalously short. But the uh, New York Times headline remains that of, the, I mean, the cigarettes have long since broken off, but the New York Times headline remains that of girl gargoyle smokes. And how about these ghoulish grotesques? The decapitation on the right and the tongue twister on, on the left on Jolene dormitory live up to what you'd expect of the word grotesque. This image shows Brookings Hall Tower from the cloisters at Ridgely Hall. Brookings Hall is the school's administration building, but has some surprisingly bizarre grotesques, such as this one that's called the dragon in his unfortunate victim. This grotesque is located on the Ann Olin Women's Building and is of the school spirit breed. You can see this, the school's slogan, which translates from Latin to shrank through truth in the center. But as I said, it's over the the, the building's entrance. So if you stand outside, just outside the entrance doors and look up, you can see the underside of this grotesque and see that it also hides a reclusive one. 
a beskirted yet mustachioed monster. Like many European Gothic cathedrals, Washington University's Graham Chapel has religious carvings on the inside, but these are balanced by many bizarre grotesques depicting the alternative to heaven on the outside. This image shows Northam Towers, part of a series of buildings at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, called the Long Walk, as seen from the Chapel Cloisters. Long Walk buildings were the first buildings to be constructed on this site in 1878, and only a small part of the original plan. One of these, Seabury Hall, has this two-headed grotesque by one of its entrances. It depicts two, gra two graduates, male and female graduates, commemorating 25 years of co-education co at Trinity. The college began admitting women in 1969, so this grotesque dates from 1994. Some Trinity buildings were built with blank spots for later carving. You can see other blanks in the towers of the chapel. Sadly, the Great Depression caught up with Trinity as it was completing construction on the chapel. There was not enough money to complete the entire plan, so some grotesque ornament was scrapped in favor of more other more practical aspects of the design. However, inside the chapel is a different story. There are many sculpted pew ends inside, and each one, each element of the carvings are important in conveying their identity. This might have looked like the small figure of a woodsman, but thanks to the sense of scale provided by the trees surrounding him, he is quickly identified as the enormous figure of Paul Bunyan. Another commemorates the chapel's primary donor, William Mather whose ancestors came over on the Mayflower. It portrays a group of William's forebears kneeling in prayer, thanking God for their safe journey to the new world. And you can see the Mayflower at anchor in the background. But what's the two figures in the middle ground? I'll zoom in. A settler, armed with a rifle, chases a Native American. This is based on a pun that William once told in which he joked that his ancestors were of the sort who, immediately after they came ashore, they fell upon their knees in prayer. Then they fell upon the Aborigines. Mather lived in a less than PC time. The University of Chicago's first campus architect, Henry Ives Cobb, gifted this gate to the school. He always had limitations imposed on him by the university trustees when designing campus buildings. However, since he used his own money for the gate, he was generous with the grotesque ornament by including creatures like these ascending the roof. There's one interpretation as to what these mean, and it goes something like this. When you first come to the University of Chicago, you have to get by the admissions officer, portrayed at the lower left. Then, as you ascend the ranks of the school, you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, and finally a senior at the very top on the right. Originally home to the Department of Geology, Rosenwald Hall has two representations of the moon each with a human character representing its age. One version on the right, the moon is shown with a child. Like the child, the moon is young and therefore has a smooth surface. This is contrasted by an older moon, portrayed on, on the left with an elderly man. His moon is older, so its surface has a heavy accumulation of craters. The International Building provides housing for international students. One relief depicts the flow of people from different cultures from the old world to the new by a steamship. And on the left side of, of this arch is a primitive man holding a club, and on the right, a modern educated scholar holding a book. The City College of New York was founded as a social experiment in 1847. The school was totally funded by taxpayers, so tuition was, was free and admission was based solely on academic merit. For this reason, the school was originally given the nickname, the Harvard of the Proletariat. But due to buildings like Shepherd Hall here, it was recently given a more modern nickname, that of Hogwarts in Manhattan. And if this is Hogwarts, this must be Dumbledore, on a bad day. Elsewhere, an ornithologist measures a bird skeleton and a geologist ponders crystals. At the top of one of Shepherd Hall's towers, an astronomer has caught a falling star. Note the telescope in his left hand. These original buildings were constructed in the early 1900s. Notice these grotesques seem in very good condition for being exposed for more than 100 years. 
Well, the secret is the Grotesta and the City College of New York's buildings are not the originals. Here are some of the originals. They consisted of terracotta covered in a thick, glossy glaze. Now, from the beginning, no one liked the glossy finish, so all the grotesques were sandblasted to a matte finish. Unbeknownst to anyone at the time, the sandblasting created thousands of mini cracks in the finish, which allowed moisture to seep in and begin to destroy the grotesque by expanding the cracks through repeated freezing and thawing. By the 1970s, these grotesques were falling apart. Starting in the 1980s, all the sculpture was taken down. The originals were put into storage and durable replacements were cast and put up. In the early 2000s, some of the originals were, were placed next to the architecture building. So near, near a parking lot next to Spitzer Hall is a graveyard of some of the City College of New York's original grotesques. Bryn Mawr College is a women's college founded in 1888 and determined to be a direct competitor to men's colleges. Important among the methods to achieve this goal was the construction of a Gothic campus. Pembroke Hall is held in high esteem as one of the finest collegiate Gothic structures in the country. This relief is a reference to Pembroke College at Oxford, which was named for William Herbert, the third Earl of Pembroke. Note the shield at the center with the Herbert with the three lions the Herbert family crest, and the French phrase and Herbert family motto across the bottom, which translates to, I will serve only one. The cloisters of the old library are encircled with many creatures, such as these two with leathery bat-like wings. The owl is Bryn Mawr's mascot, and many versions of it can be seen in Rockefeller Hall. Here, one owl interrupts another's reading or these owls attending class. I guess I was interrupting an important lesson when I took this photo. Yale University is an example of a historic university that has developed in conjunction with the surrounding city of New Haven, Connecticut. A few years after its founding in 1701, Yale moved to New Haven. This means from 1718 on, the city and, and college grew simultaneously. After 300 years, the, the Yale's campus has become enmeshed in the fabric of New Haven. So Yale uses architectural styles like collegiate Gothic to visually separate its buildings from those of the city. This is the tower of Yale's law school. When you see it, you immediately know it's part of Yale because the only similar buildings in New Haven are other Yale buildings. Plus you couldn't mistake this for an office building or a bank. The collegiate Gothic style faded in the 1930s in favor of more modern and abstract styles, but it didn't totally disappear. Yale completed two residence colleges in 2017, both in the collegiate Gothic style. On Ben Franklin Residence College, you can find this series of portraits. Who are they? Well, the key to answering this lies in the abstract relief at the center. Looks like a satellite photo you might see on Google Maps or MapQuest. Look at the building in the center. Its rounded porch may look familiar. This is an overhead view of the White House city block in Washington, DC. The Y within the White House identifies these as portraits of various Yale alumni who have occupied it. Going counterclockwise from the left, you have the 27th president, William Taft, the 38th president, Gerald Ford, the 41st president, George Bush Sr., the 42nd president, Bill Clinton, and the 43rd president, George Bush Jr. This relief decorates the outside of Polly Murray College's lounge and depicts the hamburger as was originally intended by its creator, New Haven's Lewis Lesson of Louis Lunch, on toast without ketchup. This pizza peel holds two slices. From the arrangement of the toppings, one can tell the slices come from two famous New Haven pizzerias that of Peppies and Sally's. And personally, I like the use of the pepperoni slices as periods. Pauli Murray College alludes to the early days of, co of computing by referencing computer pioneer and Yale alum, Grace Hopper. She coined the term computer bug when she found that a moth had short-circuited her computer. Modern computing is also portrayed by this electronic tablet. And personally, I really think this is an iPad. 
considering the shape of the home button on, on the bottom. These are just a few of the examples of what I found of these campuses. My book has 300 pages and over 500 photos, so, so there are many, many more. When I traveled to these campuses, I found that I had a certain advantage over, over those who lived and worked in them every day. I found that I had the newcomer's advantage of having a fresh perspective by seeing these buildings for the first time. Many people I met these institutions were surprised by what I found at their own campus. To be honest, I believe this is more to do with my mindset than my powers of observation. It's very easy to become distracted and never notice the detail around you, especially when your surroundings have become so familiar. By his generous use of ornament, Collegiate Gothic is an example of the many opportunities to find intriguing things that can exist all around us and that we may overlook every day. Things that, upon closer inspection, can reveal a variety of fascinating ideas and stories. What I wanted to accomplish by assembling these images is to show a few of the amazing things that you can find by merely noticing the detail around you. Not just blindly accepting the way things are, but asking why things are the way they are. So look around you. You might find interesting things literally coming out of the woodwork, like these old chums inside Trinity Chapel in Hartford, Connecticut. Now, remember these guys from the beginning? My sarcastic nickname for this sculpture is Pilgrim's Progress. When I first saw it, Pilgrim's Progress looked a little different. Originally, it looked like this. This is on Sterling Memorial Library at Yale University. Now, in 2017, Yale was renovating Sterling. Now, Yale has had problems with political correctness in the past, so fear and controversy the university put a blob of cement over the Puritan's rifle. This caused a controversy itself, so the whole sculpture was covered in wood. In the fall of 2019, the wood came down and Pilgrim's Progress was gone. It was replaced by this, a grotesque depicting a tutor and a student, which is a mirror image of the original grotesque on the opposite side of the gate. Note how the book they're holding is backwards in the new version on the right. All I can say about this is if Marty McFly from Back to the Future has taught us anything, is that you can't change the past without ruining the present. My book, The, the Grotesque 10, is available at thegrotesque10.com and on Amazon. You can email me at matthew.duman at thegrotesque10.com. That's Matthew with one T. So that's my lecture. Are there any questions? Okay, I'm checking out the uh, the chat and the Q&A here. I've got a, a message to go out on the chat here. So let me send that out to everybody. And uh, I want to let everybody know earlier, I checked uh, Amazon.com for Matthew's book. They are down to one copy. Oh, really? So, uh, <laughs> You guys better get there and get it quick. I can. I can. <laughs> it's not going to be there too much longer. I have so I have some more. I can. I can go and. Uh, I can go and replenish that. <laughs> okay, great. That would that would be great. I'm I'm glad that I brought that up then, so that uh, so that you know about that. Now, uh, let me see here. Now, I have to apparently I'm going to have to try to unmute some people's microphones here because I don't have any question uh, any questions up on the Q and A or the chat. Um, but uh, let's see here if I can change any of these. These. Okay. Natalie, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, I've got you unmute, unmuted. If you yep. have any questions. Hi, yes, Natalie. Hi, Natalie. Hi. How are you? Doing well. Um, Great to hear from you. And I just want to let Matthew know that uh, Natalie is, um, uh, I don't know if she's graduated yet. Not, not quite. Okay. She is still a architectural student at the University of Detroit Mercy. And uh -huh. she has a lot of interest in this uh, subject. So go ahead with your question, Natalie. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you could kind of talk more about um, how it, 
Like, so I've been hearing a lot about this sort of a controversy between whether or not we should continue repeating architecture. So it's especially something that my school has been very strongly um, opposed to. Um, like you had mentioned with the two different um, statues. So one that was actually built during that time and one that was built later on. Um, what, what, would you, what would your opinion be on um, taking inspiration from it as opposed to completely redoing the same type of architectural style? I personally, I don't mind taking inspiration from it. Um, there are at the, I'm thinking of the Washington University in, in mm -hmm. St. Louis, Missouri. They kept with the um, collegiate Gothic mandate up until, up until today. And you can see the, the buildings that have just been built are in, are in the collegiate Gothic style Mm -hmm. But they are obviously modern buildings. They have the, their plan is very open. There's a lot of glass, and those features that I had mentioned, the like the niches and things, they do have a few of those features, but they're very, they're very abstracted and they're very down. They're very downplayed. So there, there are, they they still build buildings in that style. Mm -hmm. The other, the the two. Um, buildings that I mentioned that were just that were built at Yale in 2017. There was a, I remember when those were announced. There was a huge controversy because Yale has Yale has old buildings and old styles. Also, it has very modern buildings. And when those when it was announced, those would be built in the collegiate Gothic style. There was a huge controversy. Why is Yale looking backwards? Um, well, why are not they not looking forward? And so there's a big controversy about that. Plus, they just un they had unveiled at about the same time their management building, which was built in a very modern style. And there was a big controversy about that too. So it just depends on on personal opinion. <laughs> you can't you can't escape controversy. Right. No. Definitely. Um, and. It's especially tricky with kind of mixing different architectural styles too. There is a building at Yale. It's one of the residential mm -hmm. colleges, Davenport College. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it from the from the street, it's collegiate Gothic, like the like the surrounding buildings. But if you go, if you go into the entrance gate, in through the building and out to the the courtyard, which is surrounded by more of the that same complex. It's all in the federal style. Even the building that you just walked through, the other side of that gate, the, the in interior facing the courtyard is federal. But the outside facing the, the, the street is collegiate Gothic. And that's to, to harmonize with the other collegiate Gothic buildings around it. And the transition is kind of, kind of hidden. It's kind of a cross dissolve because the only way through is, is through a low, low, dark tunnel. So yeah, there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of ways to um, kind of reconcile two different styles so they can still be harmonious. Yeah, that, that's really fascinating because um, there seems to be a lot of issues with being able to um, really mix it well. Um, like I toured have you been to University of Cincinnati? No, I have not. Um, so it has a ton of different styles. Like it, it's almost like really wacky. Um, it has some really contemporary buildings, yes. um, some kind of Georgian style, and they're all just kind of um, mixed together. And it's very tricky to kind of um, go through and not be very yeah it can be very confusing and disconcerting mm -hmm. going through a campus like that um a lot of people wonder well why can't they just decide on a style and just keep to that mandate mm -hmm. well i mean that's easier said than done after as time goes on um the tastes change and people come and go 
and even the even the ones that wanted to uh, uh, to stay with the one style end up adding buildings here and there that are from many different styles. So it's very hard to to keep them in a, 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 some sort of cohesive unit. Right. No, definitely. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for your question, Natalie. Now, um, I, I still don't have any uh, thing in chat or Q and A. Um, uh, the rest of you it, it may ask a question. If you'd like to, you may have to um, click on the mute button, which is down in the lower left hand corner of your Zoom screen. So uh, I'll just wait another minute here, Matthew, and see if we get another question. Um, yes, I have a question. Okay, very good. This is Linda Richardson. And uh, Hi, Linda, Linda, your question, please. Yeah, very nice presentation, Matthew. Oh, thank uh, you. I'd like to know what your background is. Uh, the background uh, behind you. that's behind you. Oh, Where behind me. That is beautiful. <laughs> that's that's a photo I took from Princeton University. It's Rockefeller Residence College. And I added the, um, the leaves and, and foliage myself for, for a, cause my um, safari theme. That's actually part of, that's actually about part of an image, a big panorama that I did about 30 different photos that I stitched together for one panorama. That's pretty cool. Very nice. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's the, those, like, it's like at Princeton, these buildings are very, they're very good at, it's very conducive to, to any kind of um, cerebral work. I, I, I live close to Yale University and I just, I go down there just because I like the setting and I, I would go and just because I find it conducive to getting work done. Uh, any other questions, Linda? Uh, you know, my husband was saying so many of these universities make him think of Oxford. He's from England, so. Yeah, a lot of this, this um, style, the collegiate Gothic architectural style is deliberately based on the medieval um, architectural style of Oxford and Cambridge. A lot of times, um, the architects would go to those to those campuses in England and take measurements and because they wanted to duplicate the features on the buildings. And um, what I what I would love to do, I'm waiting for co the, the whole COVID thing to let up, but I would love to go back. I went to England when I was at school. This is before I had this interest, but I loved all the um, the old medieval buildings. And so I, I would love to go back there now since I have a, a big archive of American um, collegiate Gothic sculpture. I would like to go back to, um, to maybe to England, to Oxford and Cambridge and to kind of take pictures of the original um, architecture and architectural sculpture that the American sculpture, the American architecture is based on. Kind of do a, do a compare and contrast. I think that would be fun. Notre Dame. Take a trip to Notre Dame too to see some <laughs> grotesque. Yes, I was I was horrified when I when I heard that when I heard it was on fire a few years ago. Oh, terrible. <laughs> yeah. I heard though that a lot of these a lot of this the gargoyles and things were were survived because they weren't there. They were somewhere else for um for, re for their renovation and rejuvenation. So a lot of them escaped the fire. I have a question for Mr. Richardson. You know, when Windsor Castle burned too, a lot of the, a lot of the, the um, figurines got burned and kind of destroyed there too. And they were re-sculpted. Everything was redone. Really? Yeah, all brand new. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty it's, cool. It's amazing. I mean, it's, I know just from, seeing this sculpture in America that's, you know, 80, 90, 100 years old, it's amazing to see the little personal touches that the Masons put in there. And I think that would be great 
to go to Oxford and see those personal touches that the Masons have put in into those buildings, but from 800 to 1,000 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I, somebody just sent skills. me an article about a Mason, I think it was a, a cathedral in Spain, a medieval cathedral in Spain where the, the Mason, I think they think it's a, it was a, a self-portrait sculpture of the Mason who, um, who sculpted a lot of the a lot of the interior of the cathedral, and he put himself up up in the in, in the interior as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Good show, though. Good presentation. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Mr. and Mrs. Richardson. Um, one thing I like to say, I, I kind of feel bad that I didn't go to any schools in Michigan, but I have a friend. <laughs> I have a friend who does this sort of thing and he's kind of he's his first book is out and he's working on his second book and he's from Michigan his name is Jeff Morrison and his his first book is called The Guardians of Detroit and he which he took photos of all this sort of sculpture around Detroit and his next book is called um, The Guardians of Michigan and I know in that he went to um, um, the University of Michigan and yeah. Michigan the State University. Yeah, the law school at U of M. Yeah, yes. Just like Princeton and Yale, same, same yes. kind of architecture, same stuff. They must think us English are pretty smart. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, they, I mean, honestly, they loved, they thought the, the Gothic architectural style well, they they love that um that pious dedication to to learning that it conveyed, so that that's why they they used it. Yeah, yeah, very good. It's funny. I go and see when I first saw these buildings around Yale when I was little. I assumed they were hundreds of years old. It was only later when I started doing some research that I found out well, they're some of them are even less than a hundred years old. A lot of the ones at Yale were built in the nineteen thirties. And first I was a little disappointed, but then I kind of realized, well, this is more like a, I came to see a, a college campus is kind of like a, like a theme park, like, um, like the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World, where the architecture is, is, has, a, has a purpose for it's a, it's a calculated effect on, on the people who walk by. And a lot of times it's, as I said in my in my lecture, almost subliminal, but you don't even realize it. You're just you just made to assume that these buildings are very old, and it's and it adds a, a more history to to the university itself. Would, uh, does anybody else have any other questions that they would like to propose at this time? I have uh, placed in uh, the uh, chat uh, Mr. Duman's uh, email address, Matthew with one T, dot D-U-M-A-N at yahoo.com. Uh, he posted it earlier uh, um, in the presentation. So I assume that means that uh, he may take other questions. Is that correct? Oh yeah, you can email me with any, with any questions you want, questions or comments. Wonderful. A lot of people are, when I do these, a lot of people come back with suggesting other schools that I should go to that have this kind of sculpture. Because there's, there's a lot more than, than 10 of them. I just had to put the limit somewhere. So I chose 10 schools, but there, there, there's many more. Well, that's what I thought Mr. Richardson was doing when he said Notre Dame, but apparently he was talking about the church and not, not the uh, American College in um, South Bend, Indiana. Okay, very good. Well, uh, Matthew, that was fascinating. And uh, thank you so much for coming on here today to uh, give us your presentation. Good, thank um, you for having me. I will be sending you an email in just a moment. Uh, and I would like to thank everybody else who participated and, and joined us. I hope that you uh, enjoyed this presentation. I certainly did. 
A recording of this presentation will be uh, made available at the Livonia Public Library's um, Facebook page uh, for a short period if you wanted to review this uh, presentation again. So uh, until our next presentation, and you may notice that I put some information about what we have coming in April, <coughs> excuse me, in uh, chat. <clears throat> so, but until then, uh, again, I want to thank you, Matthew, and thank everybody else for participating. And we'll see everybody next time. Good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye.